or whatever time of day it is, a very warm welcome to you and thank you all for joining us for this uh, discussion on cyber security. It is such a hot topic right now. Uh, it, it, there are some 26,000 cyber attacks happening every day. If you want to do the maths, that's one every three seconds. Ransomware, malware, crypto jacking, data theft, all are on the increase. And the global cost is huge. It's estimated that it's going to be somewhere in the realm of ten and a half trillion dollars, trillion US dollars per year by 2025. And the situation is only likely to get worse with the growth of artificial intelligence and expanding digitization of entire industries and processes. Hackers and cyber criminals are becoming better at finding and exploiting organizations' vulnerabilities. And on a larger scale, governments, nations, industries are all increasingly at risk from attacks on infrastructure and through cyber espionage. So how do we protect ourselves? Well, the key is being prepared and adopting a strategy to mitigate the threats before they occur, moving from a reactionary approach to a position of readiness. So during the next hour, we're going to be discussing the importance of having a proactive cybersecurity strategy, how to identify and reduce your organization's vulnerabilities, and the role of standards and public policy in effective cyber governance. Just a couple of things to note, uh, I'm sure you already know this, but translation is available to you through the Interprefy app. There's a QR code there where you can uh, scan and download if you need to use that, also available um, for those of you joining us through the online streaming platform. Um, at some point you may see uh, Rachel, who is our scriber, who will uh, be on stage at that white screen there. She's going to be um, creating images of the conversation that we have over the next hour. Uh, let me introduce our super speakers, and we are very lucky to have some great panelists uh, here today. Um, so on my immediate left, we have uh, Alistair McGiven, Chief Strategy Officer at Cyber Security Firm CyberCX. He was also formerly a federal agent with the Federal Police, where he established Australia's high-tech crime centre. And Lyria Bennett-Moses, Professor and Director of the Allens Hub for Technology at UNSW Sydney. She is also a member of the Standards Australia Committee for Artificial Intelligence. And joining us virtually, uh, we have Juan Pablo Castro, Director of Technology and Cybersecurity Strategist at Trend Micro. Good morning, Juan Pablo, where he leads the development and implementation of cybersecurity solutions for the Latin America region. Uh, great to have all of you speakers with me, and just a note um, that we are hope we've got a brand new thing here at the ISO annual meeting this year, which is where we are trying to make our speakers available to you, the audience, uh, after a panel or a session. So um, speakers from this panel and from the upcoming artificial intelligence panel uh, will hopefully be available in our brand new unplugged corner. Uh, that is an informal chat area where you can get to meet the panelists and ask some extra questions, and that is situated outside the main entrance to the plaza ballroom just outside the doors here. So before we dive in, guys, we've got a specially recorded message from Australia's ambassador for cyber affairs and critical technology, Brendan Dowling. Morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to be speaking to you at the ISO annual conference. I wish I could be here today, but I mean, Port Vila in Vanuatu talking about cybersecurity collaboration with some of our Pacific regional partners. The conversation you're going to have today about cybersecurity governance and a proactive approach to embedding cybersecurity in our devices, our products, and all the services that we use couldn't be more important. ISO's long taken a leading global role, particularly through Information Security Standard 27001. And today, your conversation about the next phase of cooperation and collaboration and interoperability globally around uh, standards in cybersecurity is crucially important. We look at the digitization in the region and the rapid rates in which our businesses, our communities, our people are all taking advantage of the global digital economy. That's fantastic and it brings a huge amount of prosperity. But with those opportunities comes a huge amount of vulnerabilities. For too long, we've seen devices or enterprise software being designed without security in mind. 
and that's left us exposed to malicious actors who are taking advantage of our willingness to engage online and share our information. Later this year, Australia is going to release a new cybersecurity strategy. As part of that strategy, we'll be talking a lot about the importance of security by design. We want developers, we want manufacturers, we want all companies to consider how they're factoring in cybersecurity into the products and services that they design and sell. If we're only relying on the end user to be more aware of the importance of cybersecurity, we'll be fighting a losing battle. We need products and services that have cybersecurity at their heart and we need consistency across the globe so that we're all raising our protections against malicious cyber actors. I hope you have a great discussion today and look forward to engaging with you all as you do this important work. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to Ambassador Dowling there. Um, and I should mention that there will be uh, time for questions from the floor, hopefully for our speakers. So if you're online, just type them into the Q&A box. And if you're here in the audience, when we come to it, just put your hand up and a microphone will find its way to you. So let's jump in. Alistair, I'm going to start with you. We're going to talk about the impact of cybercrime and what we mean by cyber resilience. Um, the scale of cybercrime is huge, isn't it? it? It's anything from a simple phishing scam right up to complex hacks on entire industries. Uh, explain some of the attacks we're seeing. Uh, well, I put it down to a few basic categories. I suspect there'd be the entire audience would know ransomware, which has been a really fast growing crime and devastating too, right? The concept of ransomware, for those who don't know, uh, is where a, a criminal group, sometimes state backed, but usually just criminals, will lock up systems, mm. deny access to those systems. If we remember that cybersecurity is about confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data and systems, it's the availability piece, and it's super harmful. We've clearly also seen a shift in the way criminal groups have operated in the last couple of years to what we call um, data theft extortion, where they're stealing information uh, from government and private sector entities and threatening to release that information. Um, uh, and that's got high leverage because organisations don't like the embarrassment uh, of being publicly outed. Um, We've seen quite a few high profile so data breaches, haven't we? Particularly in Australia. Yeah, there's no doubt. The last, um, in fact, it's about a year since um, our number two telco uh, had a very significant breach. It was a reckoning for Australia. Um, and then we had a series of quite high profile breaches since that time. So I'd say ransomware and data theft extortion are the most critical in terms of the public discourse. But there are a whole range of other crimes, of course, that we deal with from um, traditional espionage, the theft of um, state secrets through to intellectual property theft that we should never um, underestimate too in terms of its impact on an economy. Juan Pablo, do, uh, do you agree with that? I know you work with organisations. What are the main security risks and vulnerabilities that you see time and again in the organisations you work with? Hello, welcome, <laughs> and thank you everyone for inviting me. Yes, uh, in Micro, uh, we are part of the private sector, the vendors of cybersecurity. It's very important to understand that here the collaboration is crucial, right? We need to collaborate the private sector, the standards organizations like ISO, Interpol, uh, organizations like I, we work a lot to understand and to stop cyber criminals because we understand about ransomware vulnerabilities, but behind that, there are real people, criminals that are doing that kind of things. In terms of vulnerability, it's critical to understand that any kind of software today, and uh, today maybe we are using software in every part of uh, this conference, and maybe in the projectors that we are doing, and we are, uh, doing things and the cameras and everything and every software has a vulnerability and the cyber criminals goes after that kind of vulnerabilities just to breach into the systems and maybe that's one kind of vulnerabilities the other part of the vulnerabilities are the people right human vulnerabilities are the most difficult to maybe to fix right social engineering is critical uh, also, what we see in the landscape, in the threat landscape today, if we at least can improve our hygiene about patches and people uh, behaviors, we are going to reduce the risk a lot. And measuring that risk, that risk is critical, especially to understand that those uh, vectors, vulnerabilities in software and people, 
clicking on things that are vulnerable to social engineering and are the two main vectors for cyber criminals to produce their attacks. Liria, it's fair to say, you know, we're living in an increasingly digitized world and cyber criminals are becoming better and better at being able to exploit vulnerabilities. They're becoming smarter about how they do it, more effective. Um, how imperative is it that organizations become more cyber resilient? And what do we mean by cyber resilience? So I think it can mean various things, um, but, but most importantly, it's having a plan. Um, so obviously part of that plan is to resist the attacks in the first place, so to think through, you know, what are the vulnerabilities and, and to sort of work through that, and, and, but to note that there is no state of perfection, right? That no, that no organisation ever can sort of, you know, if an organisation comes to me and says we are absolutely secure, there is no way anyone can get in, our peoples, our systems, everything. Probably not true. You can be more or less. It's a little bit like, you know, you want to have a lock on your door. You just have to be harder to get into than the place next door, right? Um, but but you need to you need to deal with that. But, but the other important part is to have a plan for when different kinds of things can go wrong. In other words, that when there is when there is a breach, when something happens, that you're not going, oh my God, what do we do now? That you are you you have okay. This is our protocol. This is what we do. This is who we call. This is what we do next. This is what we do next. And you have a way of working through it. Part of that is obviously getting systems back up where that's possible. Um, you know, this is a bit abstract. So it's, it's about recovery, but it's also about being able to carry on so that you're not in a position where you can't do anything uh, as a company. You have to be able to um, absorb. The, uh, the security breach and be able to carry on functioning? Well, to be able to carry on functioning or to get the systems back up as yeah. soon as possible, um, um, but also to have a plan for what you do in the meantime. So that's not just systems, that's also communications. What are you going, you know, who do you have to report to? What do you have to tell them? You know, what are you going to say to people who are affected and when? Um, you know, when you, you know, bringing in the lawyers so that, you know, they can help sort of manage that side of things and compliance obligations. So, so there's a whole range of things that you need to do in the context of um, an attack. Um, Alistair, uh, I read a, an interesting study recently by the World Economic Forum um, saying that there is this, this perception gap between uh, organisations and how prepared they think they are for a cyber attack and cyber experts as to how prepared they really are for a cyber attack. Um, do, do you think cyber literacy is something that uh, organizations have to get better at so that they, they really understand what the threats are that are facing them? Yeah, as an organization, we respond to between 300 and 500 incidents a year, uh, for example, and there's no doubt that my staff who respond to those incidents have a different view and a different way of dealing with them than, say, the victim organisations. Mm. They're often the first time they think about cybersecurity is when something problematic has happened. It's not the best time to be thinking of cybersecurity or resilience or, or response. But it's the reality, right? Most organisations don't spend a lot of effort. This is all around the world, not just in Australia. Um, so there is a massive difference between those of us who exercise literally every day on cyber response versus those that are the victim organisations. We have to remember that when an organisation suffers one of these sometimes catastrophic events, um, they have shock of capture, right? They, they're, they're wondering about their jobs, they're wondering about their staff, they're wondering about their client base, they're wondering about their legal obligations, they're wondering how the public will deal with them. Never a good spot to be in to then formulate a rational plan forward. Um, uh, so we've talked about stakeholders and other things. Uh, there is a need therefore for common language. Mm. The cybersecurity industry has done itself a great harm by constantly creating new phrases for old acts. Um, <laughs> usually it's technology vendors who work out some new phrase to then sell some shiny machine that costs millions of dollars to allegedly reduce risk for those who buy it. Um, as a consequence, this dialogue is constantly moving. If I can use a, a, a solid example, in 2016, the Australians in the room will remember the hashtag census fail. Um, I'd just been made the special advisor to the Prime Minister on cybersecurity. We had a Prime Minister called Malcolm Turnbull who was yep. considered himself quite a technologist um, and he would say the first cybersecurity first minister in the world. Um, and so he's a pretty demanding boss. And you can imagine the shame for the Australian government on the evening when the world's three smallest denial of service attacks took um, an Australian government website offline, it stopped the Australian public from filling out their census forms. No great harm. But the 
catastrophic media that followed and yeah. the shame, one of the key problems that when I conducted a review into our pretty shambolic response was that no one was using the same language. Um, so, you know, a minister would interpret an attack as being different to say someone sitting in the Department of Defence who uses the word attack very differently. Like attack implies someone's shooting at you. Um, to a minister an attack could be, you know, someone's, you know, denied service to a website. They're, they're fundamentally different phrases, both meaning very different things. So, yes, l short answer to your question, which I'm randomly going to do now, is yes, <laughs> language matters. How we define that globally matters because it's the first step towards getting standards is agreeing on what the terms are that we're actually trying to do. So that we're all on the same page when it comes to looking at, at cyber yeah. resilience. Um, Juan Pablo, I saw you nodding your head there. Um, do you agree that when it comes to cyber resilience, uh, there should be an across the board response from the whole company. So top management should be as involved as IT security department. Yes, yes, I absolutely agree with that. And uh, 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 cybersecurity is a shared responsibility among the, all of us and uh, all the, the business, especially. Uh, in the ideal world, every part of the business should have a cybersecurity area. It should not should be <laughs> separated or something like IT that is today, because today is about information and anything is about information and technology. So if you have any part of the business doing that, uh, you, you need to, to have that. And going back to the previous topic, that is, um, is something that is very important, is the common language. Uh, but for me, one of the most important thing that we need to, to work together is to find a way to measure our cybersecurity posture or cybersecurity risk, especially, at least with some number, because companies use numbers to measure their performance, right? You have stock values or whatever. So if I cannot measure my actual uh, cybersecurity posture or cybersecurity risk, I cannot improve that. I cannot compare that with the past or understanding how I am uh, going against the same industry or, or whatever. So it's extremely important to be more proactive to understand that. Because if we only put some uh, maybe numbers, how many cyber attacks or whatever, this is totally reactive. Mm -hmm. And today there are not cyber ballots for cyber security. And uh, the, the quantity of attacks are going to increase because what is increasing is the attack surface. We need to understand and to measure the attack surface. That's the first important thing. And understand the attack surface has three, for me, three vectors that we need to understand. The external attack surface, how cyber criminals see uh, us from internet. The internal attack surface, when cyber criminals breach in and understand our internal vulnerabilities that are not the same that are exposed, and then the human attack surface. Mm. If we understand those three, and put all them together and trying to reach to a common scoring system or anything that we can compare, I think at this point we can improve and be more proactive about our cybersecurity posture. Just building up what, what Juan Pablo said there, um, it, it seems that it, it's uh, cybersecurity has to become part of a company's business strategy. Would you agree with that? Um, yes, I, I want to just go to the measurement point. I do too at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, 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 <laughs> just, just for a second. So a lot of the time when the people can measure cyber maturity, as it's often called, it's, it's doing a set of things. So if you're doing these things, you're at this level. If you're doing these things as well, you're the level up and so forth. And, and I'm not saying those things aren't worth doing. Um, they can be. But ultimately, the only way to know how good you are is not so much to think through what you are doing it's to test yourself in a situation of potential attack. In other words, it's thinking through from the attacker's perspective, right? So it's, it's red teaming or whatever you want to call it, where you actually say, okay, maybe they're doing all these wonderful things, maybe they've pushed themselves up their maturity levels, but is there a way in? If I'm thinking like the criminal, I'm thinking like the person trying to get in. So unless you test yourself, I guess, I guess what I'm saying is if you're going to measure something, part of the measure needs to be have we tested ourselves? So organisations and companies should test their own defences? Absolutely. The way a, a, a criminal would? The way a criminal would, and that includes the people and the, and the tech, right? So, so, you know, social engineering attacks as well as technical attacks. 
Um, but, but your question was really, you know, what do we think about this from the perspective of sort of organisational strategy? I mean, from, a, from an organisation's perspective, um, you know, it, there, there's a, there, there is a need, and we've already said this, to get this out of being, oh, this is some kind of IT issue, the IT department will sort of have a person who makes sure this stuff's okay. What you need is to have the board asking the right questions. Yeah. Um, and, um, I mean, ASIC's got a list of questions which are a useful starting point, actually, for boards in Australia, and, you know, there's, there's other lists elsewhere too, but, but the idea that, and the, also in standards for that matter, there are things that you have to put into policies, but there's, um, there's that need for the board to be able to ask the high-level questions. The board doesn't need to know the update version number of the software, right? That will be something further down. But the board needs to know that someone is asking the question that means that someone is asking the question that means that those things happen. Right, right. And, uh, and, and you wanted to talk about well, measurement I th as well. I think it was largely covered. I, I, I believe in measurement, right? It's really important. And by the way, I believe in standards to us. I get pitchforked out of here by all of you. But, um, but what I would say is, is um, our adherence to standards does not make us safe it reduces certain harms. Yeah. It gives us a muscle memory, perhaps. Um, what I will say is, when in my last government role, um, we would every organisation would have to um, do their self-assessment of maturity against our government standards. And of course, there was a lot of green on the page. Um, <laughs> if they were Harvey Ball type organisations, they were full Harvey Balls, right? They were, it was good. Things were looking pretty, pretty tickety-boo. Um, when an incident occurred, and a team would, uh, from my organisation would go in to investigate um, and we'd, I would get them just to do a quick sort of run through of the maturity of the organisation. Those, um, those greens turn to amber and red pretty rapidly. Um, Self-assessment, we know, is, is, is a start, right? And we all self-assess. I tell my doctor that I do pretty well. I <laughs> don't drink as much as I drink. I get more sleep than you I sleep. You walk way more steps. I do, actually, I do get the steps in, but everything else is really bad on the measure there. Yeah, it's a lot of amber and red. Um, so we self-assess very differently to the reality. And then even if we get independent people assessing, it's only to a standard. And I say only to a standard. I've, I've been in a car accident and very grateful for international standards, by the way, about things like how glass breaks. Um, it's much better in a car if there's a standard about that stuff. If you go through it, it's much better. Um, it still hurts. Um, and my point about standards when s in cyber is it can reduce the likelihood of certain events occurring and it might reduce some of the harm associated with them. And we certainly should measure ourselves to standards or else how else do we ever know how we're going to what the world thinks we should do or to our peers. But that itself, to your point, doesn't mean we're in a good spot when an incident occurs. Okay. And so yes, it has to become a management yeah. and a board issue. I would hazard a guess, certainly from the countries I visit pretty regularly, that most boards, most government entities around the world are really rapidly increasing their understanding of the what if something occurs question. And that's a really important place to be because there is no such thing, as said previously, uh, as a completely secure organisation. We are all uh, vulnerable and there are incidents that occur in every one of our organisations every day. The only question is how much harm. So, well, let, let's talk more about how standards can underpin uh, cyber governance. Um, Liria, uh, Juan Pablo mentioned uh, ISO IEC standard 27001. Um, how do standards underpin digital governance and, and, and cyber resilience? So I'd say that there are standards that are about strategy and standards that are about tactics, right? So you can take some of the really high level ones, things like management standards, and it's about having the right policies in place, right? So that, that really is helping organisations formulate a strategy and think about it and ask certain questions and think about what controls are relevant to their organisation and then which ones need to be put in place and how they're going to do that and how they're going to have the people who can do that and so forth. And there are standards that are about tactics. You know, there are detailed standards about, you know, locks on doors and how they work and detailed standards. Similarly, if you go into the sort of the more technical kinds of security with software, there are also detailed technical standards there as well. So I think it's about, it. it, it you, you sort of need um, both kinds. Um, but, but generally speaking, you need an organisation to be able to think about these things from a high level. And it's not all technical. So a good example that came up in the, in the, in the Optus breach and so forth that's been mentioned is what data an organisation keeps, right? What are they storing 
at all? Mm. And then in what format, you know, is it encrypted and so forth, sort of secondary to that. But even just on that first question, what is being stored? That's a quite a, a high level strategy question, right? Like, do we keep all the identification data people? Do we have to? Are there legal reasons we have to? Have we actually checked that we're understanding that law correctly? Because there's a lot of different assumptions and interpretations. And then, you know, if we do, okay, this is the bit we need to keep, this is the minimum we need to keep, and then you can start thinking about, okay, hashing it and, 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 and encrypting things and, and so forth. So that kind of high level question is, if you like, part of that strategic formulation. And it's exactly the kind of things that can only come from the top, if you like, um, and the more tactical standards and decisions as to which mm. ones to adopt that strategy, but down at the bottom of you know who implements a particular technical standard right down at the bottom, yes, that will be the role of a particular person in an organisation, probably not directly the board. <laughs> Juan Pablo, what do you want to see improve in, in cyber governance? Because uh, you know it's more than just buying a bit of antivirus software. There has to be systems in place. Um, attacks can be on systems or they can be on... Uh, breaches of, of data information. What, in your opinion, is good cyber governance? Uh, actually, uh, for me, one, one important thing is to understand that standards are critical, but also how they are enforced. Uh, because uh, we can have great standards, uh, great compliance, uh, and great part of uh, uh, governance or whatever, but actually the cyber criminals works with no standards, with no frontiers, they cooperate, they share things or whatever. They, they are like uh, mini uh, companies, right? Working together and doing that kind of attacks that are extremely complex today using artificial intelligence to create more uh, credible uh, attacks or, or whatever. But today, what uh, we are lacking today, we, we need to understand mm -hmm. that we need not only the standard, also the enforcement. Because it's like the uh, seat belts, right? <laughs> In the cars or whatever. We have the seat belts, are, but until no, the government is not enforcing them and mm. you cannot sell mm. cars in Australia without safety belts, <laughs> right? It's the only thing that's working. And we, we must understand that the cyber security and the security is like a chain, right? And all, the whole chain is as secure as the weakest part of the chain. Mm. And small companies that may, maybe are contractors of the government need to have the same level of standards. And maybe when we create the standards, say, no, no, that's a small company and they cannot afford that, but we are compromising the, the whole supply chain for that. And if governments start to do in that kind of enforcement and create that kind of uh, better regulations, maybe we can improve that cybersecurity at that part. But in the meantime, we need to do uh, what uh, uh, we have mentioned in the, in the panel is collaboration, test ourselves, uh, improve our measures, uh, everything that we can do to be cyber resilient because we cannot be 100% of uh, security. And also we need to think always about cyber risk because thinking about risk is, uh, is about how we deal with uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And we don't know what is, will be the next attack. And it could be in OT, could be in IT, could be in cars, everything today is connected and vulnerable to those kind of attacks. Yeah, so um, cyber security, cyber governance, uh, resilience, it's, it's not just in one company or organization, it has to be up and down the entire supply chain. Um, Alistair, how important is it? I know you were saying that you, you can't mitigate against every threat, but if, if you're using recognized security frameworks, uh, compliance regulations, industry standards, do they, they need to be used across the entire chain, don't they, to, to make sure there isn't one point of weakness? Yeah, I think the, if I was going to pick one area where I think standards are going to have most effect, so an outsized effect, it's actually in the hardware and the software that are the building blocks for everything organisations use them for. Uh, you know, for nearly 20 years, I've stunningly, unsuccessfully argued this case. So let me try it again for the <laughs> 20, 21st year, see how it goes. Um, if, if these were consumer products in the physical world, um, most organisations that have produced the hardware and software, this is going to go out on a limb here, um, would have been out of business because consumers would have returned the items as not functioning properly. If my fridge cut my finger off 
um, every time I opened the door or the microwave, um, you know, blew up, um, or if it was a washing machine, these things would be returned to the manufacturer. Our consumer law in most countries is pretty strong, in fact, getting stronger. The same consumer laws need to apply to the goods and services we use online, um, including the services we use online. Um, and that would drive cost, and that sounds crazy, but drive cost into manufacturers that would change behaviour. If, again, if you were that washing machine manufacturer and your goods were constantly being recalled, it would push a lot of cost into you. In fact, eventually the government would just say it can't be sold in this jurisdiction. I know it's much harder for digital goods and services to say that, but it can be, you can restrict the supply of those things into a country, um, um, and that's what should be done for stuff that we know is unsafe. Now that gets down to a business practice, again, standards, um, and let me call out Microsoft as a good example of, a, of an organisation that heard that and changed its way of working. If you go back 20 years, people would malign Microsoft as an organisation and say they're shipping software th that is unfit, that is the cause of much of this crime. There are lots of other arguments to suggest it was not Microsoft's problem, it was just the most popular product. But they heard that and they built safety and security by design into their practices and, and processes. Now that's taken a long time to drain that swamp, but it's certainly been something that that company has done, I think, very well by building into the fabric of the way they do business. Now criminals and nation states, who I spend all my life dealing with, so I'm very sad, um, will find ways to break anything, but it's how much of a threat surface that we give those offenders that matters um, and what we need to see is all manufacturers of hardware and software do these things. Now, the, then the big underlying problem, then I promise I'll stop, is when it comes to critical technologies, it's no longer that you manufacture it and you ship it. Um, you have to patch and update. And yeah. That does mean where an item is controlled from is going to matter to countries. And this is a big issue that we're all going to be facing at some stage, is not where goods are manufactured, but where goods are controlled from as they sit inside all of our national systems. Um, and that is going to be a critical problem where maybe standards can help define what access the manufacturing organisation has into a device, how you can know whether or not that access is good or bad access. Um, but what I will say to you is my telephone, which I've left conveniently off stage, when it gets um, updated by the manufacturer, it's a completely different phone um, two seconds later. So since everything is now software defined, um, the big problem we've got is if, if, frankly, states that are not democratic control those devices, then we have a much bigger problem um, as nations uh, than, um, than just cybersecurity. I mean, just on the subject of software updates, um, which are, uh, you're right, they appear on your phone and you sort of grumble a bit because you have to switch your phone off, you can't use your phone while it's updated, but it, uh, ordinary people as well need to take um, responsibility for uh, for digital safety and things like software updates have to be done constantly don't they it is a constant thing that because cyber criminals and, and vulnerabilities are being exploited every day and they're finding ways in every day so um, Liria what are some of the vulnerable sectors um, that you think uh, need to strengthen their cyber security. I'll get to that. Can I just answer one quick sure, point? Of course. Or at least add to it. Just to, just to sort of pick up a difference in terms of government policy that I think um, um, that the previous two answers had. So there's two things government can do in this area, right? One is they can say something like the seatbelts, yeah? So all organisations must X, yeah. right? Um, and what tends to happen when government does that is each government comes up with its own X. <laughs> so the New South Wales government will have a, you know, its committee and it will say, you know, all organisations must do this and then the Commonwealth government a different thing and governments around the world all sorts of different things. And I think, you know, standards actually can be a good unifying force. So if, if, if governments can craft whatever they're telling organisations to do in such a way that gives organisations the ability to adopt a sort of international standard throughout particularly international organisations that meets a particular level and governments are prepared to accept that level rather than invent all their own things, mm -hmm. that's a better way of doing it. Um, but what Alistair was saying was interesting again because it was much more about the, instead of government saying do X, Y and Z, it was more about government setting up policy through consumer law, through other 
areas of law, privacy law is another example, tort law and so forth, getting organisations to internalise what would otherwise be external costs. So in other words, instead of the cost being elsewhere in the supply chain or cost being on the consumer, you basically force the organisation to bear their costs of the harm they've caused. And we can see some of this in the changes even to the Privacy Act with more significant fines and so forth where organisations um, don't comply there. Although I still like the model of if organisations had to pay everybody caught up in a data breach, <laughs> you would find much better behaviour <laughs> very quickly. But but um, that's that's my sort of slightly... I'd give up my day job. It'd be great. We could just get <laughs> cash from... Absolutely. From organisations all day long. Uh, absolutely. But, 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 um, but, but, but going to your question about which sectors, I actually think um, that the issue is less about trying to work out what is the sector um, that is going to be under attack, because probably all of them, and more about recognising that in a sense it doesn't matter. Because what we've seen recently is, you know, a law firm gets breached and government data is affected, mm. right? That, that these things are quite significantly intertwined. Um, so I, I'm less about sort of picking the, you know, there's a game that, 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 um, that one of my colleagues plays with his students in a cybersecurity course of, you know, asking an exam question. By the time this exam's marked, you know, which organisation will be breached and if they, you know, they get it right, they get bonus points or something. But, but you know, that's, that's quite fun. But it's, you know, we could do that or we could just say, look, in fact, it's every sector. And in fact, most sectors are exposed to other sectors. And that's part of what the critical infrastructure um, reforms were about is, is recognising that, that certain sectors, if they go down, in fact, it, it, it affects everybody. So, so there's sort of more responsibility there. But yeah, I, I don't think there's a sector that's safe. <laughs> Can I pick up on that? Um, one of the trends we've seen lately um, is nation states and criminals targeting third party providers, largely third party IT providers into organisations. Um, if you think about the people that provision your computer systems, maintain your computer systems, often run your security for you as well, um, they're a pretty great backdoor or front door into your organisation. So if I target an ICT provider, I might get access to 100 entities, government and private sector entities, um, where standards could really play a role because I consistently go into these incident responses where we were then relying upon that IT provider to do the to, to do the, to help us do the detection and help do the remediation and uplift inside the very organisation that they've been unwittingly a vector of attack into. Um, what I see consistently are really poor standards, poor behaviours, poor repeatability, poor processes and policies inside those ICT providers, um, such that they can't tell you how many of their staff have access to that system what their privileges are, which systems they touch, um, you know, what's the record of the last time they touched it, et cetera. And so the better standards, if you think about the world being com not a linear process, but completely interconnected, such that a, you know, a tiny piece of software can have huge outsized impacts on a range of organisations, then what you need is all of those third parties to be, um, to be predictable at least. It may not prevent an issue, but it will make it much easier for us to understand what the blast radius is of the event, because that's one of the problems. And then it also gives us much um, faster ability to give assurance to other third parties, because everyone's connected to everyone, that the victim organisation is not a contagion risk um, for others. And, and this is the problem we're encountering consistently. So where I think standards to this great group of people and an amazing organisation like ISO is, um, how third, and you might already have a standard for third party IT providers, I'm telling you they're not following it if you do have one, is, <laughs> is, um, is what that is. That would be an outsized benefit to the rest of the world. Uh, Juan Pablo, just briefly, um, just building on, on what Alistair's saying there, how important is it for organisations to have good compliance with standards and strong security frameworks, if only to instill trust from the public who are using those organizations and giving their information to those organizations? Great. For, for me, compliance and regulation are the minimum, are the base. <laughs> we need to build on top of that because we are going to uh, complain, we are going to have the standards, but also we need to understand that uh, we need to understand about our attack surface. Why? Because the cyber criminals, when they breach in, the first thing we, they do in the first maybe five days 
is to recognize their uh, your internal networks. They understand each of the systems. They need uh, they find the outdated systems. Maybe, uh, today in October we are going to have the end of life of Windows 2012. Millions of servers are going out of support, and today there are many critical infrastructure still run, running on Windows 7 and <laughs> Windows XP today for OT systems, and that's critical. And that we need to understand that maybe we need to build on compliance, of course, but over that we need to understand our uh, areas of opportunity and improve, improve on that, thinking like uh, uh, attackers do today. What they do is to recognize they are very good recognizing and do uh, asset inventory. And they say, oh, I didn't know that I still have an exchange in this company because of their, that business process was doing that or that uh, application component like Log, Log4j that was another critical uh, issue for any business today. Uh, for me, it's very important to understand that. Compliance and regulations are the minimum. We must have that, and uh, governments should help us to enforce that in the law enforcement or uh, policies or whatever, just to create a baseline and then improve on that because cyber criminals keep improving every day. Juan Pablo, thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you uh, to all my speakers for the moment. Um, let's try and take some questions from the floor. I confess there is a very bright light shining in, shining my eyes here. So um, if you have a question, please put your hand up and a microphone uh, will find its way to you. I've also got questions coming into me uh, online. Uh, there's a gentleman in the middle row there. If we can get a, a microphone to him. There's one coming down to you now, sir. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on how to take it to the next level, to the boardroom, to the senior management, so it's not that technical. Uh, so how should they actually see that there is a standard, there are several standards, management standards that could be actually used? So I think that could be uh, interesting. Thank you. I think part of it is um, getting people to recognise that cybersecurity is not purely a technical problem. So I think there's a tendency sometimes for people to go, oh, I'm not technical, I'm a finance mm. person or I'm a legal person or I'm a business person or whatever I am. And so this is kind of some other thing that, that someone else will have to deal with. Um, I, I think it actually goes all the way, that goes all the way down. So my context is teaching in a university and one thing I'm particularly passionate about is that cyber security should be part of legal education, business education, right, right across the spectrum and not something that exists only sort of in engineering for people who are deeply technical learning how to sort of do the coding hacks and so forth. That there's a whole dimension to this and that those people have to sort of work together and learn to understand each other because this is a this is a larger problem, if you like, than, than sort of one area. So that's sort of, yeah, that's very early phase. Um, but in terms of sort of within an organisation, how do you do it? Part of it, I think, is the incentives for that organisation. So. Um, it, it's, it's partly what the regulatory regime is. So, so if, for example, you've got something like critical infrastructure laws that say certain organisations have to have, you know, think about cyber risk and think about risk management and so forth, and that's actually mandatory, you have to start filing forms and so forth, then those organisations at the very least will do that. That doesn't cover all of the software providers further down the chain. So how do you get those kinds of organisations to think about it and recognise it mm. institutionally? Um, part of it is, I think, um, you know, I, th I think it's it's changing the way we as a country talk about it, so that it's not just a, like I said, not just a technical issue, that it is something that there is communication for small and medium businesses right the way up about, you know, what they need to do, um, both from the sort of compliance perspective, but also how they can think about this as an opportunity, because there's opportunities for businesses in that software supply chain, for example, who do this right, to be able to get a benefit for selling their products to other organisations who, for their own reasons, are looking to cyber risk. So, um, I'd, I'd answer the question by saying that um, I, I think boards went... So, I think the courts will help determine... So, the concept... I'm no lawyer, I'm sitting next to one, right? You're not a lawyer either, are you? I did anyway. actually graduate in law, yes. Right, OK, well, <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in serious trouble. Uh, better let me give it a crack. Um, um, the courts are going to determine what 
a reasonable person would have done in certain circumstances to reduce risk. Ultimately, a lot of this is going to come down to, are you nodding your head at me so far? Doctrine of reasonableness here? That's a, right? Okay, no, great. Listen, <laughs> let's accept this fact. The fact is, courts are going to start determining, because there's, there's going to be litigation, right? There's either going to be sort of third party litigation, there's going to be um, regulators prosecuting. Um, we've, we've seen, for example, if you look at the headlines today in the Financial Review, they had their conference yesterday, multiple regulators standing up saying they're going to start essentially punishing organisations for failure. Here's the problem, of course. Um, uh, every organisation is vulnerable. The only question will be, did you take reasonable steps to reduce the likelihood of an event occurring and the harm associated with that event? because it is a vulnerable world that we live in. This is not the same um, as um, trip hazards, um, the safety of our workers. This is not the same because, um, you know, our occupational health or workplace health and safety laws, I can see that there's a trip hazard there, I should have known, I should have taken action. This, this is unseen technical threats. So to answer your question, I think what will happen is the, the defences will be, I can say independently verified that I met certain standards, that I followed best practice, and that best practice is codified in standards. Um, and as much as we know that doesn't prevent a problem, it will show due diligence on the part of those boards. Could, yeah. Okay. So I think I've used a lot of legal phrase. Slight, I don't know slight, how I went. Just a slight qualification. I, I think you know broadly, yes, um, and absolutely right about regulators moving into this space. Um, not just in Australia, but, but in other All countries the world. as well. Yeah. Um, I think, though, that if you actually look at the current law, it's not quite as neat as that, particularly where it's difficult to prove loss. So the problem with cyber yes. breach is that when I get all those notices saying your data's yep. put up in this and this and this, it's very hard to link that to what might eventually be a slightly higher odds of success of another attack that happens that causes mm -hmm. me, for example, some financial harm or something else and to draw it back up the chain. So in contexts where that loss, if you like, is difficult to prove, mm -hmm. without getting into the complexities of law, the litigation is harder to win. Yes. <laughs> okay. um, so I think rather than saying, let's leave it to courts under existing law, what we need to do is actually look at what our law is. And if we want organisations to have those kinds of obligations to act reasonably, we need to make sure that that, is, that that is built in for the scenarios where, as I said, the actual loss might be okay. easy to prove. All right, let's move on because we, we're getting a lot of questions online and um, this is quite an more. interesting one. This is um, possibly one for you, Juan Pablo. Um, when we discuss vulnerability, uh, we also have the issue that we're outsourcing a lot of projects to developing countries um, where there's a high chance of cyber attacks because uh, they don't have as much capacity uh, in security and cyber resilience. What are the technical challenges in developing countries? How, how do we improve their capacity? Yes, and um, that's, that's a great question. And we saw that a lot uh, in, in many countries, uh, especially when they don't have all, all the means to do uh, especially uh, the means of resources, of peoples to keep the, the patch updated. We need to understand that vulnerability is something that we are going to live with, right? But we need to understand at least that this is a vulnerable system. I understand that this is a vulnerable system. The process that run that are this, this, this. I am doing that just to reduce the risk of that uh, vulnerability and that being part of the whole risk. Someone, uh, the business is about risk, right? So without risk, business does not exist. So going back to the previous question from the audience, that is a great question. We need to try to create something to communicate with the boards, with the business level, with the leaders to understand. This is our score in cyber risk, right? You don't need to understand the nuts and bolts of this uh, score, but are we, do we agree with this risk? The industry level is that level. For example, I am 64 and the industry level is 50. Do we need to reduce that to industry level 50? Okay. So then the people that need to make the decisions have some idea of their investments and say, I, of course, if I invest that money in these projects, I am going to reduce the risk. Perfect. And then divide this risk by the risk owners in the company. 
because every part of the business should be responsible for a risk and then to understand okay you have that supplier for example imagine that uh, it's not only development countries uh, imagine that someone in australia made business with someone in south africa right and then he said okay the risk for that part of the business process is that 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 are you okay with that who is going to buy or to uh, admit that beast that's that risk for the business so that's for me the most important part it's just to understand that it's not separate parts of the chain we should put all together and understand that maybe a part of the manufacturing for a company or for an industry is doing in a developing country of course <laughs> but how do i enforce that and especially when we are working in the cloud today also that they are not uh, creating uh, infrastructure on site. So what are the best configurations or not? We need to understand that. And of course, it's challenging. For us, it's more challenging than for the cyber criminals because they only need to find one weak spot. We need to protect millions, right? They only need one. So that's the complexity and the, uh, and the, the challenging that we are having. Thank you. Okay, we, we're down to the last few minutes. Have we got one more question from the floor? Uh, right at the back there, um, microphone is coming to you. Just keep your hand up so they, here it comes. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Um, I'm part of the technical committee for the management system standard for asset management. We, send, we spend an inordinate amount of time focusing on value and so I'm listening, thinking, well, actually, what your, um, your conversations have all been about cost. So could you make a comment about what value you could create from the use of standards? And um, you know, is that important for you in this sector? Um, we spend 80% of our time focusing on value, not cost. Okay. You should start. You're the professor. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think I, I guess I was I was alluding to this before, right? I mean, it, it, there is a there is a value in a a product that can demonstrate through, for example, demonstrating compliance with standards among other things, that it is a that it can be used in particular ways without you know without, you know minimizing particular risks. So there is you know if, if someone I mean if I know if I have all the facts and someone says you know do you want to install software A or software B where they do similar things and software A is more secure than software B, most people are going to go for software A. So there's clear value in this. The challenge of course is in is in people being able to recognise that value. And I do think there's a role for standards there, right? I mean, we've talked about, I mean, in IoT as an example, we've talked about the possibility of some kind of labelling mm -hmm. so that consumers can be, you know, informed as to, you know, the relative security um, ratings of different products. And there's a lot of challenges there. I'm not saying that would be an easy thing to do. It changes over time. You can't put a sticker that's the truth forever and so forth. But if we can find ways you know, through standards, through measurement of being able to communicate the, the, that value of, for example, software that's in the supply chain, then yes, I think there's a clear value to companies in, in, in doing that because it will increase the, um, the value of their product. So to me, the value is trust. And if you look at brand value, um, there was a survey released, um, I'm gonna say a month or so ago here in Australia, looking at brands and their trust value not picking on Optus, but it is the anniversary of the breach, um, uh, their brand equity has gone down massively. Mm. That, now, whether that's translated to business, less handsets being bought, less subscribers, I don't know. It's, a, it's not a listed entity, so we don't have that transparency in their economics. But brand value matters. So um, we see a major cyber incident, so in a negative way, impacting brand equity. The other thing I would say is your ability to actually function as an organisation will become increasingly related to your ability to withstand mm. cyber incidents, which are occurring all the time, but it's how much harm is, is, is associated with them, how public it is. The smaller the matter, usually the less public. Um, and, and therefore, I think that you know, just, just by operating um, in a very toxic and increasingly toxic threat environment, it's, none of the indicators are getting better. 
um, everything that we're sailing into is worse weather. And that means that um, it will increasingly be this bifurcated world of the organisations that pay attention to this um, and can function, and those that frankly won't function, literally won't function. Uh, and as a result, the value is your existence. Thank you very yes, much uh, indeed for your question. Uh, Sorry, Juan Pablo, go on, carry on. No, no, just building on that, uh, on that topic that is important. Uh, standards uh, increase our security controls, improves our security controls. So if we can improve that, we can reduce risk. And then if we can communicate that risk correctly to the board and to the business, it's going, that it's going to produce value. And uh, the most recent example is about the casinos in Las Vegas, right? MGM uh, incident, that the whole business was stopped by not not using standards or maybe not communicating well the risk of not having those standards so it's not only the standards it's our ability to implement the security controls and the communication the language we need to improve that to transmit that to the business and to understand that the value the real value is to reduce risk and to improve the cyber security posture and of course the cyber resilience Thank you very much indeed, and thank you for your uh, questions. I'm just going to let our panellists have one last comment, one last thought that they want to leave you with. Um, this has to be very short, guys, because we are running out of time. Juan Pablo, well, let me start with you. What is the final thing you want to say to the audience? Yes, for me, the, the, the final thing is about the collaboration. Cybersecurity is about a whole thing together right it's not only it it's not only vendors it's not only the private sector it's not only the government it's all together that should be something that uh, need to be considered as a risk for the humanity right a, a national security risk for me that's the most important thing collaboration thank you juan pablo alistair um, standards matter the time it takes to create them is being outstripped by the technology industry that is creating the problem. Um, you have to change the way you make standards. It's a tough problem, uh, but it's the only way for you to have an outsized effect and, and you're very essential to our existence. Thank you, Alistair and Lyria. I, I agree with the collaboration point. I think it's a collaboration between government getting the policy settings right, standards being able to help organisations with the how in terms of, of both from an organisational perspective and from a meeting any regulatory requirements perspective that those standards help at the strategic and at the tactical level and that also within organisations that there's collaboration. In other words, it's not the technical problem. It has to be something that the organisation works together on. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed to all my speakers today. Thank you for your questions. And if you do want a chance to speak to any of the panellists in the sessions that you uh, see today, um, the cybersecurity and the upcoming artificial intelligence panel, which is taking place in about an hour's time, and I really hope you join me for that one as well. Uh, the speakers will be available in Unplugged Corner at quarter past three this afternoon. Uh, for about half an hour if you want to carry on the conversation. But for the moment, thank you. Please have a round of applause for my speakers.